labor unions are the hot topic of today, from Hollywood actors and screenwriters all the way to McDonald's fry cooks and Amazon warehouse workers. There's a chance that your place of work has a union of its own, or unions. Maybe you've been in a situation where you didn't know which workers' collective to join. Or maybe you're an employer who has to negotiate with striking employees time and time again. From the outside, the difference from one union to another can seem trite or non-existent. Like Monty Python's People's Front of Judea versus the Judean People's Front. But you only need to speak to a union leader to learn that their group bargaining is better than the other guy's group bargaining. If you're feeling confused, relax. That's normal. But maybe you've never encountered a union. Maybe your boss or your boss's boss wanted nothing to do with them. Maybe you've wondered why unions and companies are at each other's throats all the time. Are unions really the enemy of business, or is the rivalry between them a spin of tactic from fat cats? Are they a thing of the past, or is their history just getting started? And why can't you wear white after Labor Day? Whatever your first-hand experience, unions aren't going away anytime soon. So today, we're going to pick apart the Picketers' legacy to understand where they came from and where they're going. So it's time to learn how history works, as we explore the history of unions. Historians and economists debate what the first labor union was. The most debated are similarities between the labor collectives of today and the Masons of ancient times. The Freemasons might be seen now as strange rich folk who hop around on one leg and control the world, but the origins of their secret handshake has been said to date all the way back to the building of the pyramids. The time of the pharaohs was not a time of paid vacation and casual Fridays, but the ancient Egyptians did have some interesting HR tools. Take this 3200-year employee register. The tablet details worker attendance as well as the reasons for absence, such as mother's illness, a scorpion bite, and needing time off to mummify their dead relatives. We've all used that excuse. For some historians, these practices offer a foundation for the birth of the Freemasons, though naturally some contest this given the mystery surrounding the group. That aside, the basic idea is Mason workers banded together to ensure they got a fair deal on construction work. Given the state of literacy and writing amongst the population, workers relied on secret handshakes to know who they could trust and who could be vouched for as hardworking and dependable. Even though there would have been those who could write and had access to papyrus, it is hypothesized that it was far easier to find alternative ways to signal your rank and skill set. We must stress, however, that this story is highly contested and the links between ancient Egypt and the traditions of modern-day Freemasonry are tenuous at best. This leads many historians to believe that the claims of a proto-labor union building the Sphinx are merely a fabrication by long-dead Freemasons who were interested in bolstering their credentials and reputation. Still, it's amusing to imagine stonecutters refusing to build pyramids because their employers didn't give them more sick days for scorpion attacks. For a more concrete historical case, we must now turn to the labor movements of late medieval Europe. Craft guilds might sound like a group of pretentious Dungeons and Dragons players, but these 12th century labor movements organized well into their peak in the 14th and 15th centuries. Back then, serfs who toiled the lands were bound to which lord prevailed over them. By contrast, townspeople were freer. As one might expect, the village blacksmith or butcher needed ways to pass on their skills so that the people would prosper after their death. But in these times, getting a job wasn't as simple as handing over a resume. Tools for crafts were simple and limited, so the skill set of a craftsman was evident in their output. If you think your industry is oversaturated, imagine being the only other blacksmith in a town. The role of these guilds was less about controlling the market and more about securing the longevity of the population. One role of the guilds was to limit the labor supply by setting up regulations into becoming a craftsman. You'd start as an apprentice in the hope of becoming what is known as a journeyman, which was someone who was qualified yet distinguished. Think of it like the difference between the new guy in the warehouse versus the guy who got his forklift operating license. They're both workers, but one has more mobility and bragging rights. Anyway, an apprentice or journeyman would shadow their master until they were able to produce a piece of work worthy of being called a masterpiece. Doing so would earn you the promotion to craftsman and grant you all the responsibilities of one. Sourcing raw materials, selling goods, and supervising your own apprentices. Climbing the ladder wasn't easy. The craft guilds were strict on which tools and techniques would be available to you, but they also dictated your wage and working conditions. It might sound strange, so think of it like this. There were unions comprised exclusively of soul traders that dominated the local market. By today's standard, this monopoly would be criticized for its limited access to positions of economic influence and power. But there's a world of difference between controlling Wall Street and running a local market in some hick medieval town somewhere. They were born more out of pragmatic necessity than commerce, but that all changed as populations grew. As towns spread, so did the crafts guild. Wood carvers had their guild, and wood painters had theirs. 
This helped to facilitate specialism and development of crafts, trade, and technology. But soon, a counter-movement appeared. Specialisms were sometimes not differentiated enough. Was a wood carver really that different from a wood turner? Soon, guilds competed for raw materials. Classes within crafts appeared. Think of it like small towns going from one blacksmith to large villages having blacksmith franchises on every corner. Soon, masters employed many different craftsmen, and the guilds were absorbed into merchant guilds. With money making as the guild's objective, it became harder for journeymen to enter a class because masters preferred to hire them as wage workers. That's like forbidding the forklift operator from running his own factory because you can hire him to operate a forklift in yours. In time, the craft guilds disintegrated. Journeymen started selling their craft for wages outside of town walls, meaning they were outside the jurisdiction of guild regulations for better or worse. In effect, these early unions had been defeated by the monster they helped create. But things got worse, and then better, in the next couple of centuries with the arrival of the Industrial Revolution. The world changed when steam power was created. Now, humans no longer needed beasts for torque. Now they could construct machines to dramatically increase output. But people were still needed to operate machines and aid in the general day-to-day goings-on of factories. The sheer volume of work available made it easy for Victorian masters to have bargaining power. They decided who got work and for how little pay. And if you didn't like it, no problem. There was always someone else desperate to take advantage of the growing economy. Shifts were long and arduous, and the conditions were dangerous both in the short term, like getting your hand caught in a machine, and long term, such as the impact to your health. Now that the craft skills were well and truly a thing of the past, it was harder for workers to secure improvements to labor laws of regulations, especially when it came to children. After all, children had been part of labor since time began, but the 18th and 19th century were different. Their small, dainty hands made it easier to get into the nooks and crannies of dangerous machines that adult-sized humans couldn't reach. Exploitation was rife. However, the influence of the Industrial Revolution was so wide-reaching and profound that it took a real labor movement to stem the tide. This movement, it was a little thing called Marxism. At the risk of oversimplifying, let's just agree that the rights of working men were at the forefront of a lot of political thought. So, while socialists, communists, and Marxists duked it out over in Russia, the ripples of their actions and thoughts spread to the rest of the world. Workers banded together to protest unfair working conditions. They stonewalled factory owners by refusing to work, and they campaigned the government for changes in policy. Bit by bit, the working class in Europe and America won rights that we still have today, like shorter hours of work, higher rates of pay, safer working conditions, and even things like health nope. benefits and a lunch break. So remember the fight of those hungry Victorian factory workers the next time your manager demands you work through lunch at your desk. The first major legislation passed by the British Parliament was the Factory Acts of 1802. Now, children could work fewer hours until the bills culminated in the outright banning of child labor. This got the ball rolling on public schooling, which means that the right to a basic education is a consequence of workers unionizing. If you're still in school, you know who to blame. But even after this groundwork was created, labor movements organized to secure more rights and correct more wrongs. One case was the Luddite movement. They were a group of textile workers who protested the introduction of machinery that would result in job losses. Their tactic? Sabotage. Their efforts were eventually suppressed by military forces. In fact, violent reaction to unions is synonymous with the history of the labor movement. In 1819, workers gathered in Manchester for a pro-democracy and pro-labor reformation demonstration. However, cavalry charged the crowd in what became known as the Peterloo Massacre. Of the 60,000 strong crowd, up to 700 were injured and 18 died. Unless you think it was only British workers getting killed. America's labor force has its own bloody history. Take the Haymarket Affair of 1886. As police officers were dispersing protesters, someone threw a stick of dynamite. The blast took the lives of seven officers and four civilians, plus injuring many more. Eight anarchists were convicted of conspiracy, though there is some debate over who was responsible. In any case, historians seem to agree that this moment helped create International's Worker Day on May 1st. That is not to be confused with Labor Day, which is celebrated in America on the first Monday of September. Europeans tend to celebrate May Day more than their counterparts in the U.S. of A. In France, for example, riots in the streets are seen as a natural way to celebrate the yearly commemoration. As for us Yanks, September is taken more seriously, which is why it's a social faux pas to wear white after Labor Day. You can't wear white shoes after Labor Day. That's not true anymore. Yes, it is. Didn't your mother ever tell you? 
The logic goes that only the rich could afford seasonal wardrobes. Light colors in summer, darker colors in winter. That sort of thing. Well, as September marks the unofficial end of summer, there was a tradition amongst the American upper class to transition into their colder weather attire. As you can imagine, white fabrics don't do too well against the slosh and mud of winter, unless you could afford a seasonal wardrobe, that is. All this is to say that back then, you could spot a yuppie because they weren't wearing white in the winter. Nowadays, of course, fashion rules have changed, so take this with a pinch of salt. Now, lest you accuse us of being card-carrying communists, let's examine the pitfalls of unions, and where better to start than the infiltration of labor movements by organized crime. A recurring criticism against unions is how the positioning of an authority between you and your boss means you're dealing with a different kind of overlord. It is said that the strongest argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. This quote was wrongly attributed to Winston Churchill. In reality, he said that democracy is the worst form of government except all the others that have been tried. The point is that the democratic nature of unions means they are susceptible to the flaws of any democratic process unfairness, ignorance, populism, corruption, and mob rule. Mob rule became the name of the game when La Cosa Nostra used the strengths of unions to achieve their goals in New York City. In essence, the mafia created a climate of fear among employees, employers, and union leaders to run extortion rackets. All they had to do was make sure voting went in their favor. If you've seen The Sopranos, then you know how Vito greased the unions. You'll probably already know that Tony's claim to working in garbage collection is a nod to how organized crime got their dirty mitts on the refuse industry when cities stopped collecting commercial waste. In doing so, a space opened up for private haulers, which was a prime target for mobsters looking to add more layers of obfuscation between them and the law. The collective of workers would be used as a cover for illegitimate activity. They could hide paper trails of bribery, corruption, and money laundering. They also decided who got employed by controlling the hiring halls. These places were used to dispatch workers to different jobs, kind of like the switchboard for a telephone operator. Except now, the mafia could directly place their associates in different positions. Some were workers, some were managers, some were union leaders. Fighting back wasn't easy. Sticking your neck out was a way to lose your job or possibly your life. Kickbacks were normal, as were the shakedowns and silencing tactics. To this day, the exact influence of gangsters and unions is debated. Some say that there are still threads of control that lead back to mafioso. Nonetheless, a lot of power was taken from the hands of criminals when the U.S. passed the RICO Act. The Racketeering, Influenced, and Corrupt Organizations Act of 1970 gave prosecutors tools to pry criminal influence out of workers' unions. But perhaps this proves what Thomas Sowell said. Unions do not work for workers. Unions are for unions in the same way corporations are for corporations. By the 1980s, unions were in a strong position, especially in the United Kingdom. Then came along Margaret Thatcher. Her government was pro-free market and anti-regulation, whereas unions had more collectivist tendencies. Depending on your political temperament, Thatcher's destruction of unions was at the service of greedy corporations, and her regulations were needed to sap the power of controlling and obstructive labor movements. When she came to power in 1979, high inflation and unemployment was putting Britain in an economic tailspin. Many of the strikes that brought the country to a standstill were organized by powerful trade unions, as was her and her party's view that the ability to govern had been severely impacted. In essence, they believed the country's economy was being held hostage. So in 1984, the Trade Union Act was passed. Some of the conditions included the requirement for secrecy when it came to deciding strike action. Defenders will argue that this removed social pressure to fall in line with group thinkers, whereas detractors argued that it was designed to prevent unions from mobilizing. There were other restrictions too, like limiting the ability for unions to call for sympathy strikes. But most of the heated battle was Thatcher's fight against the National Union of Mine Workers, who were protesting the closure of the mining industry. If you remember the movie Billy Elliot, then you've seen the setting, except with fewer ballerinas, of course. In the end, Thatcher defeated the strikers, which is now seen as a turning point in the power balance between unions and government. As a result, union membership dropped, influence waned, ideological differences fractioned unions too, which further weakened labor movements. Since then, the power of unions is up for debate. Recently, Hollywood screenwriters and actors went on strike over the use of AI technology to replace them in a case that is reminiscent of the Luddites destroying the sewing machines which threatened to replace them. Fruit pickers had their labor movement squashed when the U.S.-backed military opened fire during the days of the Banana Republic. This echoes the casualties of Peterloo all those years before. 
And though the Mafia has mostly been kicked out of unions, the likes of Amazon using instructional videos to stamp out talks of collectivization suggest that the new boss is the same as the old boss. So is the history of unions repeating itself due to the inherent nature of labor movements, or is it just a sign that the man will always find ways to kick the average Joe when he's down? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. As for the Hollywood strikes, the current labor movements are a transition of new technology such as the streaming industry totally disrupting the workforce. But we've all seen this happen before. So watch our video to understand why these movements are happening in the first place. And don't forget to like and subscribe to keep on learning how history works.